Hi, it's uh, Kevin May here in the Focuswire studio at the Focusrite Conference 2021. Delighted, thank you very much, Ted Evers, founder and CEO of TripTuner for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, this is the fun bit because I'm going to ask you about things that you wrote for us nearly two years ago and see whether they still hold true, okay? Yeah, that'll be fun. All right. Uh, fairly at the, the outset of the pandemic, so uh, April, May time, you wrote a thing, piece about virtual tours and how that was going to be a really important part at the time. Mm -hmm. And that kind of made sense because no one was going anywhere. Right. But you did say in that piece that you thought it was something that would stick around. If there was something that there was enough, you know, the, the quality would be good enough that actually people would stick with that. Do you still believe that to be true? I do. Maybe maybe not in the traditional sense of people thinking virtual travel will replace physical travel. Yes. But absolutely, all of that content that's been created can certainly be repurposed. Uh, and if you think about where things might be going, I don't want to get into the metaverse too much, but, um, you know, like Brad Gerson yesterday was saying how, you know, if you can kind of experience a place uh, that can give instant gratification and then make you even want to go and be there in, in person more. And I think that's ultimately the, uh, the benefit or the objective, obviously, of any kind of virtual travel content. But I, I think it can be repurposed and, and leveraged. Were you doing the virtual tours yourself with TripTune? No, no. Actually, we're just, um, again, we're, you know, recommendation engine helping surface relevant content. So whatever content the partner would provide, uh, Visit Florida, for example, was a partner. We did a beach finder for them so you could virtually tour all their beaches. And that got picked up by Travel and Leisure. Um, so they got some good exposure from that. OK, I know you said you don't want to talk about Metaverse, but, you know, it is the uh, <laughs> it is the kind of one of the things that's emerged this year that's mm -hmm. got people talking. I mean. Do you see the fact that it's Facebook or Meta, as we now need to call them, that they are behind it, that that's going to be that's going to be something that's going to push that concept to a wider audience? That's what's going to be needed in order for something like that to take off. Sure. Well, uh, they already have a very wide audience, so they exactly. don't have to push it, exactly. push it too yeah. far. So, um, yeah, they certainly have a lot of leverage in saying this is what we're doing. Um, it's what will be interesting to see is to what extent will it still be a walled garden where it's, uh, you know, their users and marketing to them using their data, et cetera, to determine what type of experience that there is. Yeah. OK. So one of the other things that in another article that you wrote for us, we're talking about the, the perfect personalization storm. Mm -hmm. Talk us through that, what your kind of uh, idea around that is. Sure. Well, I, I think. You know, the pandemic, well, first of all, I'll get back to personalization techniques, right? So um, often it's based on your historical travel behavior. So naturally, if I go to a site and I'll get ads for, you know, the, the last three conferences that I've been to, and that's not really inspiring to me. I want to go someplace new, right? But when you have 18 months plus of no travel, you have no data on what, peop what people are doing. So that's part of this perfect storm where you don't have that, that the luxury of having that historical data to determine what someone might want. Yeah. Um, and then also the other piece of that is are the increasing privacy regulations as well as the, the, you know, the disappearance of third party cookies making it a lot harder to track. So that creates a storm of, a perfect storm of how do I figure out what this person wants and particularly in the moment, because, you know, as we all have seen with with uh, COVID, a lot of traveler preferences have changed. So it's not necessarily who someone who someone was pre-COVID, but where they want to go now and what they want to do now. What do you believe some of the behavioral changes that have happened uh, that are going to be in the long term now? It's permanently changed the way we think about whether it's destination selection, what airlines we choose, what kind of hotels. What ones do you think would last? Well, I think an overarching change, I think, would be flexibility. And obviously yeah. the ability to cancel free cancellation uh, policies. But also, I think, you know, like like so many other trends, COVID has accelerated uh, people's desire to explore different places and kind of keep their options open. So they may, you know, the you think of the traditional we talked about in the past also, you know, the funnel being a sphere and not necessarily a linear line where someone says, I want to go here. And then there's that journey. But rather, I've got a couple. This is the type of experience I want to have. And here are the several options. And we've seen some, you know, like Expedia data I've seen where people are, are looking for two or three destinations, uh, you know, per session. So it's a little bit different than uh, I know I want to go here. Um, I'm going to plan it out. And, and obviously with COVID, that destination may or may not be open. So you have to be flexible. But I think flexibility in a broad sense will be the thing that's going to stick. 
Okay. Uh, Ted, you said that the, the, the true source of behavioural, being able to track the behaviour of consumers is the booking. Isn't it actually the search behaviour? Because then you get a better sense of the parameters of what they're looking for. Yeah, I think what I was referring to in the booking is that's how the, the tracking is done uh, in, in terms of, so, so you could search on something and not yep. purchase it. So the booking is the ultimate vote of, this is what I want to do, right? So absolutely search, search data will go into that. And to build upon that, I think a lot of the search methods need to change. And that was one of the impetus uh, for me to create TripTuner and to have such a distinct UI that's totally different from, you know, the, just a search box. Where do you want to go? What dates? How old are your kids, et cetera? Okay. Uh, you, you quoted Paul Graham in one of the pieces that you wrote for us, which is do things that don't scale, which is a little bit kind of Steve Jobsian, isn't it? So <laughs> fail fast and fail often or whatever the phrase is and stuff. You know, and it appeals to the people in Silicon Valley because it's, that's the culture of it. But do you think that applies to the travel industry? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's because, well, if you, for testing at least, right? So if right. you want to roll out a new feature or something, you don't want to uh, invest so much. And a lot of this comes from my, from obviously reading Paul Graham, but also uh, adopting to this lean startup methodology with, with TripTuner, which is something that's a little bit different, I think, than, than the travel industry is used to in the past, where it's kind of like, we're going to roll out this, this project, we're going to put some press behind it, and then, wow, it may flop. And, and that's, that's very time and resource uh, intensive. So if you're able to test things on a smaller scale, so doing things that don't scale before you build and invest a lot in a particular um, project, you can test it out on a smaller scale um, that may not be scalable, but at least to test the demand um, how it works, how consumers uh, behave and react to whatever you're trying to, to do that's new. Can you tell us about one of those that you've tried that was phenomenally successful, but also one that was just, oh my goodness, that was terrible. <laughs> Gosh, there have been uh, so many, so many um, kind of kind of micro moments like that. But um, I mean, overall, I would just say TripTuner in general as my, my the grand experiment, right? Because uh, if you look at what we're doing, it's it's totally different than any other other website. It's just a you know a wall of images, and then like a little old stereo equalizer to adjust your preferences. So a very different UI, but with using um, things that people are accustomed to. So I would say that was the big gamble, and I had to kind of launch it to see if it would work. And we wound up getting some good press around it, and people said it's like it knows me. So we had good qualitative uh, feedback, and then when we started licensing it to some of our partners, we got that quantitative feedback. So that would be one of the on, on the uh, success side, and on the on the not success side. Gosh, there's there's many of those as well. Um, Did any of those? <laughs> I, I tend to try to put those in the back of my mind, no, so but they that, don't jump. That, that's why we're here now, is to bring them back to the front of Absolutely. your mind a little bit. Absolutely. So, I mean, would you? Is there a tendency to do things that just don't cost much money because there is the risk of failure? Um, well, that, that's just a function of. of uh, the, the business, right? And, and how much uh, resource you allocate to certain uh, testing. So obviously, I mean, I bootstrapped this, so there's there, there wasn't a huge R&D budget. Right, so okay. you did by definition or, or out of necessity have to test things on a smaller scale before you can invest in, and move further with them. Okay. Before we went on air, we were talking about our respective amateur or maybe more professional <laughs> DJ careers. And uh, is that is that the inspiration for the tuner? Absolutely, part of that's that's exactly 100%, where it came from. Like, so we, you and I may know this, or like some of, some of the audience might the remember, but, but actually, you know, the, all the stereos used to have equalizers. So if I'd go to a house party, I, I didn't really know what an equalizer did, but I knew that if it made a little shape, it would sound good to my ears. So okay. I said, what if we could do that for travel and say this is the type of experience I want, and it's gonna we're gonna see options that are in tune with your tastes. Very good. Okay, and lastly. And you worked for Travelocity. Yes. And you worked for eDreams. eDreams. So, uh, got to very... shout out Site59 as well. That's where it all started. And Site59 as well. Yes, indeed. So, how do you reflect on that time when you were there? Um, just um, with a lot of uh, fond memories. It was, it was a fantastic experience. Um, Site59 was my first job in online travel, so 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Uh, I was hired as a writer. I thought I would be a, a travel writer. They found out I had business experience, so I wound up signing up hotels and working partner marketing and doing everything that a, a startup team does. Yeah. And when we were acquired, when the first dot com boom was kind of, di uh, you know, fizzling out, it was we were very lucky to be to be with Travelocity. It was good cultural fit, and we did some great things there as well. And and eDreams was fantastic being in Barcelona and really interesting, different approach to the business. 
So it gave me a good, um, you know, rounded perspective on things. So certainly uh, eDreams and then being part of Travelocity after the Site 59 acquisition. I mean, what did you, what did you learn from those experiences that you've now applied to TripTuna? Yeah, well, um, um, number one, just being scrappy, right? Just doing a lot with doing a lot with less. Um, number two, um, the importance of team and culture and and getting everyone to kind of just do everything that they can to push for success and you create those bonds. And that's just a really, that's a special part of any venture, right? Okay, uh, Ted from TripTuna, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate Absolutely, thanks you, Kevin. Thank you.